guys, this is Down Phoenix, and welcome back to another episode of what I'm playing. Today, we are playing a legendary and phenomenal indie game. That is Dead Cells. Dead Cells is one of my favorite games of 2018. It is just such a well-polished and crafted game. I spent over 40 hours playing it originally on the Nintendo Switch back in the day, and you might be noticing that I'm playing it still, but I'm not playing it on the Switch. That's because it recently came out on Game Pass, and they've added all kinds of new content and updates to it since I had last played it about this time last year. And so I really wanted to revisit the game and see how it progressed since the last time I played it. This game does something that most roguelike games don't manage to do. I love roguelike games. I love games that give you the possibility of emergent gameplay through ever-changing conditions and environments. That is, the game has a predetermined set of items and enemies and obstacles and things like that which populate the game world, but they're randomly generated in a way to give you a unique experience every time. Which is, of course, a very novel concept. I mean, essentially, it can be a game of infinite possibilities. But eventually, we do get sick of them. Because through any random generation that's caused, sometimes it's better than others. And Dead Cells does something that most games in this type of genre doesn't do nearly as well. And that is the way that it crafts the encounters and the environments in the game. Even though it is randomly generated like most roguelike games, it has a very, very well done random generation that feels handcrafted in most cases. Now that's not to say that the random generation is perfect every time, but even though it is randomly generated, there is enough of a feel of a human connection to the design. It doesn't feel like that it's a computer just randomly throwing variables together, even though that is essentially what it is doing. But it is using those variables in a very intelligent way that doesn't... Like, if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't realize it's a randomly generated game. Not until you die or beat the game and restart it. And notice that the levels have changed, that the locations of things have changed, the placement of enemies have changed, and so on. It, that's when you realize that it's randomly generated, but when you're running through it, you don't have that semblance of it. And it's also due to the world building that this game really does fantastically. Because, like the Dark Souls series, you get elements of storyline sprinkled throughout various areas in the game and they tell a very bare bones but a very well told story nonetheless kind of like dark souls there is a lot of lore and there is just a richness to the mystery of the game that i really appreciate i can't say a whole lot about the story it is actually kind of confusing in a way but it is really interesting stuff. It's just a very interesting encounter throughout the adventure. Uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a, I guess, synopsis about it here. You're this untold adventurer that cannot die. You achieved immortality, essentially. But that immortality doesn't mean that you can't die. Like, you basically come back to life every time you die. And you also have to deal with the fact that the mysterious conditions of the island that you're stuck on means that things always change around. However, you do find these various fragments of storyline that kind of explain this motive and this lore of this island. And there is a mad king that rules across the island. And... Essentially, you're supposed to break a curse by killing the Mad King. But, as you know, things are not quite as they seem. 
and you have to go through various obstacles and challenges every time you beat the game you unlock a boss soul and whenever you use that boss soul you can increase the difficulty and the challenge of the game and vie for the opportunity to unlock another boss soul or you can stick with an existing difficulty and move on from there i'm actually playing on the first boss soul difficulty here i believe it goes up to five boss souls if i'm not mistaken um and of course as you progress and you get through the harder challenges you get even more storyline so it's a really minimalist way of building out the story and lore but it does it in a really good way as well because the whole challenge is key and paramount to that story you know in order to actually know everything you have to be able to surmount the most excruciating challenges in the game and this game can get ridiculously hard that being said, I do have some experience with it whenever I first put it up on Game Pass. The very, very, very first run. Even though I haven't played the game in nearly a year. I still was able to complete it from start to finish on that first run. Uh, which I consider pretty impressive given that I've been green. But I played the game so much whenever I was playing it on the Switch that, you know, I, I was just hooked. I really was. You know, constantly, whenever I die, I would immediately go right into the next run and try to repeat, you know, try to get farther and farther, experimenting with different types of weapons and gear, different powers, trying to see what worked out best for me. And there is just a lot to this game, and there's a lot of ways to play it. So essentially... The type of action that we've got here, it's a super fast-paced game. I mean, this game is one of the fastest action games I've played. It is basically a Twitch game. Unfortunately, the response time of the controls and everything like that are spot on. Like, there is absolutely no input lag whatsoever, which is really impressive even for a 2D game of this nature. Because even some of the most finely tuned games like this do you still have a little bit of noticeable latency, at least on modern displays like we have. But this game feels buttery smooth. It felt buttery smooth on the Switch. Feels buttery smooth on the Xbox One X that I'm playing this on right now. Very well done. The action is superb. And there's just so many ways to fight through these encounters in the game. It's very impressive. You can go in knives blazing as fast as possible with a quick double dagger setup you can use spears and you can use heavier weapons like broadswords you can use bows of course different types of bows shields parrying is something that is normally very challenging for me in games like this but i can parry extremely well in this game the parrying is some of the best i've seen in a video game and part of that, of course, is due to the responsiveness of the controls. Because when it comes to a game like Dark Souls, I can't parry worth a crap. And part of the reason is because Dark Souls, honestly, has a little bit of a heavy weight to the control. A little bit of latency. This is the exact opposite. Like, everything is almost instantaneous from when you do it. So... When you press the shield button, you know that you're going to have your shield out, like, almost immediately. And so it really helps you get used to the timing. Now, that's not necessarily the case with all shields. There are some shields, like heavier shields, that have a little bit of weight to them. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, personally, I like to use the Assault Shield. The Assault Shield is, in my opinion, the best shield, at least that I've unlocked so far. And part of the reason is due to the assault nature. It's not like an assault rifle, right? <laughs> it's not like a shield that rapidly blocks. But what it does do is it acts as its own weapon in a way. You can actually push enemies with the shield and do some damage to them. So it can act as a really good secondary attack. And it also has a really good ability to interrupt enemies as well because some enemies may have attacks that wind up or whatever. And the assault shield can actually kill that wind up. So it's free damage against the enemy. You get a free momentary stun. 
Plus, they don't do their attack, you know? Win-win for you, but not for them, right? And, of course, it does a really good job of parrying. It's one of the faster shields in the game, so you can parry very easily with this shield. So, if you get an enemy that's about to hit you with a projectile or attack, you can negate that damage and roast them alive with that badass shield. So definitely look forward to the assault shield. I also love using the twin daggers, of course. Due to how fast and furious you can attack in this game, speed is king, at least in my opinion. And the twin daggers are some of the highest damage per second of any weapon in the game. Now, the individual attacks may not do the most damage, although they do a lot of damage for the type of weapon you're using. And you just attack really fast with the twin daggers, so you can do tons of damage. I mean, I had some loadouts where I was doing five digits in damage per second with this weapon. I basically killed the final boss on the lowest difficulty, mind you. But I killed the final boss in, like, maybe five attacks. You know, that's how powerful I was able to get my character uh, with that. But, yeah, it's just totally badass. And... You know, there's a lot of good weapons, of course, but definitely the twin daggers, love them. But you have to keep in mind that your encounters may vary with this game because, you know, everything is randomly generated. You do have to learn to experiment. You do have to learn to get outside of your comfort zone. Now, once you find weapons that you really like, you definitely want to hang on to them as long as they're feasible. You know, because like these twin daggers may be great now, but if I get a few stages in, I'm obviously going to have a very good chance I'll find a better weapon than what I've got now. Because the loot does appear to get better as you go through. And you can, of course, upgrade your loot. There's ways you can upgrade it with the gold that I'm getting right now, for example. I can spend that in between areas in order to increase their viability. But that being said, it still is advantageous to upgrade when it is feasible to do so. so so you have a great amount of risk and reward in this game which is another thing i really like it's something that i really wasn't able to i guess express so well until i watched daryl does games he did a video about dark souls or dark souls dead cells and about the risk reward system of the game and how it is so brilliantly done, which if you haven't watched Daryl Does Games, I mean, that is a channel that is fantastic. That's a channel that is arguably one of the best on YouTube right now. I'm not even kidding. And this dude doesn't even have 10,000 subscribers. He should have like 10 million subscribers, honestly, with the quality of content that they do. I mean, it is excellent. So definitely check that out. I, um, but anyways... <laughs> Back to the point of this here. Dead Cells does a really good system of risk reward where it teaches the player that in order to maximize your potential, you have to learn to take risks in this game. And sometimes those risks may put you in spots that are very uncomfortable for the player. They may put you in situations where you have to deal with great chain danger. But there can be great reward to that. But the game does constantly pose the question of, is that reward actually worth it to you? And only you can answer that question, of course, as you play through the game. You learn the way you play the game. You learn the affinity that you have with how good you are with certain weapons and how good you are with utilizing certain combinations in conjunction with fighting enemies. How good you are with dealing with those enemies. You know, if you're able to handle them up close and personal or if you have to take care of things at a distance or if you use traps or any number of combinations possible and i know it sounds like i'm really rambling but i guess the point i'm trying to get across is is that it's not just the fact that the game is randomly generated but it's the fact that even if you and several other people had the exact same seed where you're going to encounter the exact same dungeons, the exact same equipment, the exact same enemies, and all the exact same spots, which would probably be unlikely to be possible 
Although, if there was some way to randomly put in, like, a seed number, I guess this could be something they could test. I would think that the developers should consider, given the ability to pop in a seed so you can see what other players might do on the same run that you do. But, because of that fact, you know, because of the number of possibilities of the way to play this game, every player is going to play uniquely as well. So, and that's even if the game did not have unique stages at all. That's just due to the amount of robust environments, enemies, equipment, skills, you know, challenges that you encounter in this game. And that is something I really appreciate with Dead Cells. Uh, Dead Cells was one of only a handful of games that I played last year that earned a perfect 10 out of 10. As a matter of fact, I didn't have any games that were AAA titles, except for God of War, I might add, that were worthy of a 10 out of 10. But Dead Cells is top notch. It is, as of this moment, my favorite roguelike game, and I hope you guys appreciate it. With that, Down Phoenix out.